Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. For our scripture reading this morning. Hebrews 12. We're going to look at verses 14, 15, and 16. And we'll read them responsively. I'll, we'll begin together reading verse 14. I'll read verse 15. We'll end together on verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 12. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing together, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 14. Ready? Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this morning. And Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful music today. Our hearts have been blessed. And uh, Lord, we've been encouraged. And it's just good to be here this morning. And Lord, I'm praying now that you'll continue to prepare us for what you have for us from your word today. Uh, blessed is special to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All of grace is my story all the way from earth to glory since by grace he lifted me from sin and woe. Living grace has extended as on him my heart depended and he'll give new grace when it's my time to go grace not yet discovered grace not yet uncovered grace from his bountiful store grace to cross the river to face forever there'll be new grace I've not needed before there's been grace for every trial there's been grace for every mile there's, there's been grace sufficient from his vast supply grace to make my heart more tender grace to love and pray for sinners but there'll be new grace when it's my time to die grace not yet discovered grace not yet uncovered grace from his bountiful store grace to cross the river needed before grace to cross a river grace to face forever there'll be new grace I've not needed before Amen Our Father, we bow before you in prayer this morning. We thank you, Lord, for, again, the good service we've enjoyed so far, the good spirit that's in this place. And Lord, I bow before you as we come to the preaching of your word and opening up your word together. And Lord, I, you know I need your help this morning. I want to be clear. I want to be concise. I want it to be understandable. I want it to be helpful. And I pray this truth we look at today would be beneficial in the lives of many listening here in the room this morning and even watching by way of the online ministry. And so, Father, help us today in these next few minutes now control our thinking to ask you to help us to focus and to listen carefully to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit of God. Help me to say what I need to say and 
leave unsaid what I don't need to say. And Lord, take the words that are said in the scriptures we look at and use it in the hearts and lives of your people this morning. And I'll thank you for what you'll do, for I ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a man whose health was very good. He had no health problems, as a matter of fact. Everything was strong, his heart was good, blood pressure was normal. But when his father died, he got into a heated legal dispute over his will with his sister. They both fought over dad's will. In fact, they fought so much they took it to court. And in court, the court ruled on the side of the sister. And from that time on, all the man could think about was the lawsuit and his sister. He talked about it. He thought about it. He talked about it. He thought about it. He filled himself with it. It became his obsession. Each day he grew to hate his sister more and more. And it wasn't long until he began to have difficulty with his blood pressure. And then he began to have difficulty with his heart. Not long after that, his kidneys began to bother him. And it was only several months later that complications took his life. Now it's pretty obvious that his physical injuries came on from powerful emotions. But what really killed the man was bitterness. Bitterness. He committed spiritual suicide. And the trigger that he pulled was the trigger of bitterness. In fact, bitterness has been linked to all sorts of glandular problems, high blood pressure, cardiac disorders, ulcers, and even insanity. You won't be saved very long. In fact, you don't live very long until someone will sin against you. When I mention that this morning, I wonder who came to your mind. For whom do you hold bitterness? Don't, don't be so quick to say, nobody. Nobody. Just just think for a minute, and before God, be honest. If somebody came to your mind when I said, against whom do you owe bitterness, if somebody came to your mind, the Spirit of God had them come to your mind for a reason. Because He wants you to deal with that today. Now, it may have been last week, it may have been last year, it may have been decades ago. But the truth is, the reason that person is still there is because you have never forgiven that person in your heart and in your mind. Now I know, one of the most difficult things when it comes to that word bitterness is admitting we have it. Nobody wants to admit they're bitter. No one likes to say that word, especially about themselves. Bitterness comes from a word that literally means sticky. You see, it's one thing to be angry for a moment. It's another thing to let it stick with you and stay with you. When that anger sticks to you, it grows into resentment and that grows into bitterness. You know, once it's, you allow it to stick, it's awful tough to get off. It's like, it's like finding a piece of gum that's been ground into your carpet. 
and now you've got to dig it out. Very difficult thing to do. But if you harbor bitterness in your heart, it is one of the most destructive things you can do. Someone said, and I think it's true, bitterness does more damage to the vessel in which it is stored than on anyone upon which it is poured. The Bible calls it here in Hebrews the root of bitterness. The root of bitterness. Let me tell you about the Spite House. There was a millionaire who owned a lot in an exclusive residential area of the city. But the lot presented unusual problem because it was about two yards wide. Only six feet wide, but it was well over a hundred feet long. And there was nothing he can really do but sell it to one of the neighbors on either side. And so he approached the one neighbor and asked if he'd be interested in buying the lot. And the neighbor said, well, yeah, I guess I could do you a favor and buy it from you. And named a very low price. And the millionaire was insulted. He said, that's not even a tenth of what it's worth. And so he stormed out and went to the other neighbor. To his dismay, that neighbor offered even less than what the other guy did. He said, that, he said you know what? He says, I know you can't do anything with that property, so either take my offer or take it or leave it. The millionaire left in a rage. And within a few days, he hired an architect and a contractor, and he built one of the strangest houses ever conceived. Five feet wide, 100 feet long, the length of that property. Each, it was nothing more than a row of tiny little rooms that could barely put a piece of furniture in. The neighbors complained, but the city officials said there's no codes or violations uh, that they could stop him from construction. And when it was done, they say that millionaire moved into that tiny little place and lived out his days there. But that house became known throughout the city as the house of spite. And it's still there from what people say. It's a monument to one man's hate and spite and bitterness. And there's a lot of Christians that are living in a house of spite. There's a lot of Christians, if we could see what's in your heart, you're living in that 5 by 100 house. You say, well, pastor, you don't understand. You don't know I've been hurt. You don't know what they did to me or what they said to me. And I, and I, I would say, no, I don't. But I would answer you with this. How did Jesus respond to those who crucified Him? The Bible says He could have called... Twelve legions of angels, the songwriter said ten thousand angels, to destroy the world and set him free. And they certainly were standing by, waiting for the word, and they certainly could have taken vengeance. But instead, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now I want you to look at Acts chapter 8 with me, would you please? Go over to the book of Acts in chapter 8. Because here's a startling thing. Here we come into a, a fella named Simon. The Philip is preaching in the cities of Samaria here. Many people have come to Christ. They were come to Christ and got baptized. Men and women, it says in verse number 12. Simon makes his profession of faith in verse 13. And yet he 
verse 17, it says, They laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now you have to understand something about Simon. Simon was kind of a big shot in that city before Philip got there. And when people begin turning to Christ, they turned away from Simon. and Didn't follow him anymore. What he was looking for was not the Holy Spirit. He was looking for the power. He wanted his power back. He wanted people to follow him again. And he figures if I can do what you guys are doing, then everybody will come after me again. I want that position back. What he, had, what he didn't understand, he had become bitter and didn't know it. Isn't that an amazing thing? Do you think you could really be bitter and not know you're bitter? Let's read on. But Peter said to him, verse 20, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Boy, I wonder how many churches would have Peter be their pastor. You're not very loving, Peter. Don't judge me. Well, Peter laid it out, didn't he? Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and the bond of iniquity. And Simon said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Simon never knew he had bitterness until Peter pointed it out to him. Anybody ever said something to you or done something to you and you found it difficult to forgive them? Every time their name's brought up, it doesn't matter if it's been years ago, you still get those feelings in your stomach. Still there. You think of them and your heart rate increases. You think of them and your blood pressure begins to rise. Because you're kind of reliving it all again. At the mere mention of their name and you thinking about it. If so, you are in the bonds of bitterness. It's a shame. Because bitterness doesn't touch the person you're bitter towards. It affects you. It's an internal poison eating its way out. I call it the, the, the worst cancer you could have. There are some cancers now they're working to where you, they can have some cures for and, and of course others... Uh, there, there are not, but there is, there is a cure for this one. We'll come to that in a little bit. You see, the person you're bitter at continues on with their life, and they may be happy and content and probably may never even think about you. But because you hold bitterness for them, they continue to control your life. Bitterness. Let's go back to Hebrews 12, will you please? Are you all right? We're just beginning. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. The writer of Hebrews here, notice what he said in verse number 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. When I allow bitterness to come into my heart, you know what I do? I'm failing the grace of God. What's the grace of God? It is God's sufficiency. It's God's help. It's God's enabling in my life. 
and in your life. It's God giving us what we need to do what we ought to do. That's grace. Okay? And we miss that. We fail that. We do not get that because of bitterness. We lose out on the grace of God that He would want to give to us. And you know what happens? You become bitter. You become troublesome. And you know what happens? It troubles you and thereby many are defiled. You're troubled and you're bitter and then you end up having a bad outlook on life and complaining about everything and you defile everybody else that you come in contact with. It's bitterness can be very, very contagious. I want to give you six things today that bitterness will do to your life. Then I'm going to give you the cure for bitterness, all right? Six things bitterness can do to your life. Number one, bitterness will devastate you spiritually. Bitterness will devastate you spiritually. Because if I get bitter in any area of my life, then I'm not doing what God tells me to do. In other words, if I, if I have bitterness in my heart, I am in the flesh, I am not in the Spirit. Uh, when, you, when you see the fruit of the Spirit or the outcome of being filled with the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, bitterness. Huh. What? Which one doesn't belong on the list? Huh? Yeah. You know, nobody ever says, I'm, I'm filled with the Spirit, but I sure am bitter. Those don't go together. It devastates you spiritually. You're either, can, 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 anyway, we either walk in the flesh or we walk in the Spirit. In fact, the Scripture says if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And I would contend with you, bitterness is a work of the flesh. And if we're and and, and so it 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 if you want to shut off the spirit and you want to shut off walking in the spirit, allow bitterness. Allow allow someone doing you wrong or being wrong to you. Let it stick, and it'll devastate you spiritually. The second thing bitterness does, it'll destroy you physically. Mention how much like a poison it is. Medical doctors say bitterness will make you sick. Bitterness has been linked to high blood pressure, ulcers, headaches, cardiac disorders, and even insanity. One leading psychiatrist wrote, 90% of all people in insane asylums could be released immediately if they would learn how to forgive. Why is, it that, why is it that we've had such a, a rise? Listen, there, there, there's such a correlation. If anybody wants to be honest and look at it. We have, a, we have a generation. We have a generation now of people who do not know the Bible. And do not know God. And a vast majority who do not go to church. And, and now we have also at that same time a great number of people who take pills. A lot of pills. The average American, average American, has 16 to 18 prescription drugs in their medicine cabinet. Now, the correlation comes, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm being destroyed physically. And when I go to the world for help, what do they want to do for me? Give me a pill for it. And that brings on a whole other set of problems. And when I had to tell them, well, I got these problems from taking this pill, they said, well, you take this pill to take care of those problems. And, and you keep balancing out what, what you have to do. But, but you know, and, and some of you, and listen, be honest, be honest, you say, you know what? 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you never heard of that kind of thing. 
What some of these terms that people come up with you never heard of. But we had people that were people who followed God's word. We had people who followed God in those days. And, and, and it changed them physically. God's, God's medicine for not allowing anger to turn into bitterness and stick with you is found in three words. I forgive you. And don't say, don't say, I forgive, but I don't forget. Then you didn't forgive. You didn't forgive. And you don't, listen, we're to forgive one another even as Christ, God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. And how does God forgive us? God says, I forgive you and I cleanse you from all unrighteousness and your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. God doesn't forget them. He chooses not to remember them. So, well, I can never forget. No, you'll have to ask God for help, won't you? And then you make a conscious decision I choose not to remember that anymore. That's what God does for us. It's exactly what He does for us. Aren't you glad He does? You don't have to raise your hand because I think everybody would raise their hand. When I ask you this question, how many of you have committed, the, committed a sin in your life, the same sin, more than one time? Everybody's hand would go up. Have you ever felt like you go to God and say, I did it again? You know what's great? God says, did what again? God says, you, you did that before? I don't remember that. If you've asked him to forgive you. Okay? It destroys you physically. It'll devastate your life spiritually. It'll destroy you physically. It'll discourage you, number three, it'll discourage you emotionally. Whenever there's bitterness, there is always discouragement. One way you can tell if you have some bitterness is you become a victim to everything and everyone. You, you become very judgmental. You begin, to, you begin to think you know what everybody else is thinking. Yeah, I know why they did that. Well, yeah, I know why they said that. See? And you begin to perceive you know exactly what they're thinking. And, and, and when someone's talking, you think, oh, I bet they were talking about me. Hmm? Can I help you? They probably weren't even thinking about you. But bitter people eventually love no one their family, themselves, or God. Bitterness will discourage you emotionally. Number four, bitterness will divide a church. Hebrews says many will be defiled. God, God does great things in a church. God does great things in our church. You want, you want all of that to stop. All it takes is bitterness. And boy, it puts a, a, the, the brakes and a screeching halt on everything. Many be defiled. You see, spiritual maturity... In fact, you've heard me talk about this before. Spiritual growth. How do you measure your spiritual growth? How do you know whether you're growing in grace and growing in your Christian life? Do I compare myself to somebody else? Oh, I'm better than you are. I'm better, well, yeah, and Danny said, yeah, I'm better than she is. Is that, is that growth? Is it, is it spiritual growth if I'm just doing more than I was before? Huh? No. 
How do you measure spiritual growth? You know how you measure it? Am I more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? Am I growing to be more like Christ? Am I, respond, am I growing spiritually so I respond more like Jesus? And listen, your spiritual growth mandates that you rise above the pettiness of getting offended at things or people. I, I laugh anymore when people say, well, I don't want to offend you. Can I, can I help you? You can't. You can't. I'm a, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. You know what a servant is? A servant, the word literally is diakonos, which is a eater of the dust. I'm eating dust. You're going to offend me? You think about that. You know why we say we get offended? Because we have pride. God will allow us at times to be hurt so we'll learn to respond like Jesus responded. And you know the thing about God? If you don't pass the test, He keeps giving them to you. You, you, he won't, you won't get off the hook. He won't say, ah, we'll just pass you on to the next grade. It'll keep coming. Until you respond the way you should respond as you grow in Christ. Bitterness will devastate you spiritually, destroy you physically, discourage you emotionally. It can divide a church. It'll, number five, bitterness will defile your relationships. All of us have influence. Every... Every relationship you have, you have influence in that relationship. There are, I tell you before, when I was in junior high and uh, these guys' age, you guys are 16, aren't you? 15? 16, 15? When you're that age, girls, how old are you? 13? Okay. You're that age, you know what? I come home and, and, and my dad would say, you've been hanging around so-and-so, haven't you? He's not a school. He never sees me during the day. How did he know I'm hanging around that guy? That's right. He had rubbed off on me. And either words I said or mannerisms or things I did, he could tell who I was around. We all, we all have that influence. And can I tell you something? I said earlier, bitterness is very contagious. And if you're around someone who's bitter, you know what? It rubs off. It'll defile you. And you'll, you'll come away. Everybody's had that experience. You come away from somebody and all of a sudden, man, you just feel like you're negative and you feel like you're, you, you have, you're, everything's dark and you're thinking bad about things and you think, man, what is wrong with me? How come I'm feeling this way? How come I'm thinking this way? Because you were just around someone who had bitterness and it rubbed off on you. What's your... What's your influence? What, what, do you, what do you put on people? How are people when they leave your presence? Are they joyful? Are they saying, you know, Elon has had the other experience where we left somebody and thought, man, that was delightful. That was really enjoyable being with them. Boy, you know, you left somebody, you know what you say? I'd like to get together with them again sometime. That was nice. Because we came away with joy and peace and love and we and, and joy and peace and love. Where have I heard those before? Oh yeah, the fruit of the Spirit. Huh. Number six, bitterness will deprive you of blessings. It'll deprive you of blessings. It's a root of bitterness. It means 
anything you allow to stay in your life will grow. Roots have to be dug out. That's not any fun. I told you before, we have, in, in our yard, we have a little side yard there, and, and just it's inside. You, you can't hardly see it. We've got a big tree there, you know, and so when there's, and there's stones over there, and I just like to take the weed eater and whack them down. I'd look at it and say, that looks real nice. Now, I, it, it takes me less than five minutes to take care of that. And I like that. My wife goes out and gets on her hands and knees with gloves on and pulls. I don't like that. That's work. It's a whole lot easier just to chop things off and say, yeah, I look good. I got my, got my suit on and my tie on. I'm carrying my Bible. Don't I look good? And inside, the root of bitterness is still growing. Still growing. It's not stopping. And it's going to show itself again real soon. Those things will come right back up again. Anything you allow to stay in your life is going to grow. You have to get it out by the roots. Can I just say this, and I'll get more detail about this in a minute. Jesus Christ can pull pull that out by the root. Listen, I just said pulling those roots out is, is hard work. But he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Will you allow him to do the work of pulling the root of bitterness out of your life? You have to let him do that. We mentioned earlier there's a couple consequences Hebrews mentions about the consequences of bitterness. Number one, it'll trouble you, it says in verse number 15. When that root of bitterness springs up, it troubles you. It'll trouble you with sorrow, depression, anger, physical maladies. In the case of Esau, it drove him to immorality. Bitter people are some of the... And by the way, a profane profane person is someone who has no respect for sacred things. No respect for the things of God. There, you know what happens? The, the main occupation is bitterness. The main focus of my life is bitterness. It troubles you. They're some of the most miserable people on earth. And if you're here today and that's you, you're miserable. You know it. But then it doesn't stop there because it says it defiles many be defiled. It defiles others. Bitter people always affect the people around them, whether it's your family, your friends, the people you work with, those who look up to you or follow you. We, we to this day, suffer the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin against God. Our, our sinful habits do hurt those who follow us. Always. Well, Let's look at the cure for bitterness, all right? If you're bitter today, there's hope. All right? You don't have to live that way. You don't have to carry that around. There's there's two parts to the cure for a bitter heart. Notice our part. Verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Looking diligently. There's a diligence on our part that we have to keep we have to monitor the heart to make sure that, that offenses don't stick. That they, we have them go away. Who do we give our offenses to? Absolutely. Surely he hath borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows. That's what he does. What did he say in 1 Peter 5, 7? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Put it on Christ. Give it to him. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Get off of the fact that, well, I know God says this, but... No, 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 no. Don't, don't put a but where God puts a period. If God said it, that settles it. And you obey it. You do it. You be diligent. You put forth the effort. Say, I'm not going to let that stick to me. And you be diligent about it. And you know what happens when you're diligent about it and you're looking diligently? God's part is the grace of God. The grace of God. If I allow the bitterness, I'm hindering God's grace. When I refuse to allow the bitterness to stay, I'm inviting His grace in. I'm allowing it to come in and help me. But you have to be diligent about it. Did you know, did you know the grace of God was not just for you to get saved? It's to help you live for Him every day. His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. It's every day. It's the grace of God. And you need that every day of your life, not just to get saved. And so it's the grace of God. So you have to admit that you have the bitterness. You have to be willing to cast it on the Lord, give it to God in prayer, and say, Lord, I don't want this to stick to me anymore. And I'm going to do this, Lord. I'm going to love Your Word, because great peace have they which love Thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I want to love the Word of God and be a student of the Word of God and, and let Your Word be precious to me and I'm going to be faithful to Your Word and faithful to help others. And I'm not going to let bitterness stay with me. I'm not going to let anger stick with me. Consider Jesus Christ, will you? A lot of bitterness towards Jesus. A lot of bitterness of the people who were crucifying Him. Putting the stripes across His back. Putting the nails into His hands and the crown of thorns upon His head. And yet Jesus in that agony and in that pain said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. How can he do that? Grace. Grace. Grace is giving someone what they do not deserve. That's why we're saved by grace. Do we deserve salvation? No. Grace. Well, I'll forgive them, but they better ask me for it. Where's grace in that? Where's grace in that? Well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. You didn't deserve to be saved. Grace. 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 That's how He forgave. That's why the, all of Hebrews 12, it's an amazing chapter. But it all starts out with us running the race. And when you run the race, who are we to keep our eyes on? Because yeah. the only way you're going to keep from getting better is keep your eyes on Christ. I'm going to tell you something. Listen. Every single person is going to disappoint you or hurt you or discourage you 
or disappoint you sometime in your life. Everyone you know. Except Jesus Christ. You better keep your eyes on Him. Earthly friends may prove untrue, but Jesus never fails. I've known Him over 50 years. I know there's a gasp that goes up to the crowd. He's never failed me yet, ever. children of Israel crossed the Red Sea and they got thirsty. And they came to a place where there was water. And it was called Mara. And as soon as they started to drink that water, it looked so good. And boy, as soon as they put it in their mouth, they spit it back out. The word Mara means bitter. What are we going to do? There's bitter water. And God told Moses, you cut down a tree and throw that tree into the water. And when he did that, you know what happened to the water? It became sweet. How do you, how do you turn the bitterness of life and the bitter things of life as you look at them and turn them into something sweet? You only do it by putting a tree called Calvary. And throwing it into your water. And Calvary makes the difference. Jesus Christ makes the difference. It's where you can look at Joseph at his brothers and say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God used that in my life to make me more like Christ. Therefore, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Though everyone else might look and think it was a bad thing. There's nobody that hasn't been wronged at some time in their life. Everybody has a story to tell. The pain that you suffer from being wronged is not unique to you. It doesn't make you special. It's what you do with the pain that will set you apart. You've heard it said often, life either makes you better or it makes you bitter. The only difference is the letter I. What will I do? You know what God says? Let all wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. Before he mentions any of those, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, you know what comes first? Bitterness. It all started when somebody got bitter. He said, let all of that be put away from you and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Will you do that this morning? Will you release from prison? You think you're releasing that person who's wronged you, but the person you're releasing is you. Will you take the hurt that you've endured and the wrong you've been done, and will you just give it to Jesus and say, I'm going to forgive? I forgive. And live for Jesus Christ. Count on His grace to give you what you need to continue to move forward and to remember it no more. Secure for your bitterness. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you bore our griefs and our sorrows. You not only paid the sin debt, but you died that you're able to take all of the hurts and the pains and the wrongs of life 
that have been done to us. And Lord, this morning I'm praying that first, if any in the room have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would trust Him as their Savior today. They would realize He died on the cross for them. But Lord, this morning I'm thinking there's people in this room who have struggled with bitterness. They got angry, they got upset, and they've allowed it to stick. Lord, I pray by the grace of God, they would ask you to remove it by the roots and take it out of their life today. Free themselves from the prison of bitterness. To rid themselves of the poison of bitterness. May they experience the joy and the freedom that forgiveness and love bring. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning that say, Pastor, I know if I died this morning, I'm 100% sure, no doubt in my mind, that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'd go to heaven. All right, you may put them down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, if I died this morning, I don't know for sure where I'd go. I'd like to go to heaven, but I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? Would you let me pray for you? Would you just slip it up and say, pray for me? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I wonder how many believers are here this morning. I would say, Pastor, I'm one of those ones. I'm struggling with bitterness. I think I've let some things stick that I should not let stick. In fact, it's taken root in my life. And I'm going to ask God today to dig it out by the root. I, I don't want to live in this prison anymore. I don't want to live with this poison in my body anymore. And if God will take it, and He will, I'm ready to give it to Him. And allow Him to make it better, not keep me bitter. Pastor, pray for me this morning. The Spirit of God is dealing with my heart. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. Listen carefully. If you slip your hand up today and you say, you know, Pastor, I don't know. If I died, I'd go to heaven. After I pray, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Bob will sing. And you just slip from your seat right down here to the front. We'll have someone take a Bible and they'll show you how you can know for sure from the Bible how you're going to heaven when you die. And, and don't, don't miss that. That's, a, that's the best decision you ever make in your life and most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Others will be coming to pray. You just slip out and come to me. We have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible. They'll take you to a private place and they'll show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. Christian, you need to come and pray, come. If you need to pray with someone, we'll give you someone to pray with you. If you just want to pray and give it to God, give it to God this morning. Free yourself today. Rid yourself of that poison. Live with joy and peace and love. With goodness, with faith, with meekness. Live with the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You'll be so glad you did. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing on this invitation time now this morning. Thank you for speaking to hearts today. I pray that those who do not know, if they die, they'd go to heaven, that they'd step out this morning and allow someone to take a Bible and show them. Those who need to come and kneel and ask you to dig out by the root their bitterness. May you do the work in their heart this morning. Thank you for your goodness to us. Have your way in this invitation. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist is playing. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? That's right. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my 
thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it wholly thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me. Abide, O Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee, send a revival, start the work in me, Thy Word declares, Thou wilt supply our need for blessings now, O Lord, I humble.